name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today, on this Sunday, before the elevation of the Holy Cross, we hear both the parable of the wicked vine dressers, as well as the marvelous word from our Lord, the marvelous word through the word through Apostle John, that the love of God is manifested in and through the cross. If we take these two readings together, we begin to understand that there are really but two ways in which we can live, often referred to in scripture and tradition as the way of light and the way of darkness, or the way of life and the way of death. Just as the Lord spoke through Moses long ago, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life. And this diversity of paths is one that is not put aside in the New Testament, but made all the more clear. And the choice of paths is a stark one that we must all, each one of us, must make. First of all, we see the way of darkness well illustrated and the attitudes and actions of the wicked vine dressers. It's a way of life that seeks my own gain, my own pleasure. It clings to possessions, to power. It wants more. Unwilling to share and ready to use others for my own gain or pleasure, a what's in it for me attitude. But in reading about this, we mustn't think this warning applies only to some other people, people outside the church. Sinners out there somewhere. Because remarkably, the wicked vine dressers still pay a lip service to God, to a master far off, though their actions are unfaithful to him. Historically, we understand this parable as a warning to the Jewish leaders at the time of our Lord's earthly life, but it isn't limited to them. As Jesus himself and the prophets remarked, it's a situation where, and I quote, these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. These warnings, these cautionary words, apply just as much to us today as to the Jews of that time. Yes, Jesus promises that the gates of hell will never prevail against his church, and this truth is unshakable. But we must all, both individually and collectively, remain faithful stewards, faithful servants of our Lord, lest we be found unfruitful or unprofitable branches that must be pruned from the vine. We see that the vine dressers maintained a formal, theoretical tie to the Master, but no longer acknowledged Him in their hearts or through their deeds. Likewise, we have to understand that even if we're formally in the Church, unless we remain dedicated to serving our Lord Jesus Christ, unless our hearts remain His, there's a real danger of falling away. But let's not dwell on that, on the negative. Let's turn rather now to the positive, the way of life. The way of life, which is the way of the cross. As we heard so beautifully in the other Gospel reading, the cross is what reveals and manifests divine love. And it's worth listening again attentively here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that is, be crucified. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. St. John Chrysostom remarks that God's love is so great that the Son of God would have still become man and ascended the cross even for the salvation of one single person. We owe Christ such a debt of gratitude, says St. John, as if he had come for the sake of me alone. For God would not have begrudged the whole economy of salvation, even if it had been for only one person. For he loves every person in the same measure that he loves the entire world. Realize that. God loves you just as much as he loves the entire creation. Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross was offered for all of human nature, and was sufficient to save everyone, even though only some would believe in him and benefit from it. The fact that not all people would come to follow him didn't deter him from bearing the cross for the sake of all. Rather, he is like that excellent king in the Gospel reading, who prepared a great banquet and invited everyone to the feast, though sadly many made excuses not to come. 
This is, brothers and sisters, divine love. Going to the end, to the extreme, doing all that could possibly be done for the salvation and love of another, regardless of whether or not that love and sacrifice is even acknowledged. And that's the part that's especially hard for us to understand, humanly speaking, because we might be very willing to give, or we want that acknowledgement in return. But God goes, His divine love goes beyond that even. We stand in awe before this. We can only begin to thank God for what He's done for us and to try to live worthy of it. Thank God for what He's done for us and to try to begin worthy of it. But if we do this, if we do this little thing, then we've already entered upon the way of life. The way of life. Who is so great a God as our God, we sing. His greatness is shown not in grand displays of power, but in the greatness of His love, His sacrifice, His nobility. Through, though being all-powerful, He doesn't defeat evil through a force of strength, but through a humble self-offering. We also heard St. Paul remark today, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. But what does it mean here for the world to be crucified to us and we to the world? We hear, hear the word world is not used in the positive sense the scripture sometimes uses when speaking of the goodness of God's creation, but rather what the Apostle John terms the things of the world, as he calls it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But to paraphrase, that is a sensuality, a greed, and a pride. This is what we are to crucify in ourselves if we want Jesus Christ to reign in our life. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord. One is holy. One is Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We'll sing very soon. But is He the Lord of my life? That's really the question for us today. Because if He is, then what must we embrace? Well, nothing the opposites of those things of the world that Saint, the Apostle John spoke of, namely, purity, generosity, and humility. Purity, generosity, and humility. It's that simple. As the Apostle James wrote, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's actually nothing more extreme in our world today, nothing more countercultural, nothing more radical than to embrace the way of the cross, the way of purity, generosity, and humility, that is the way of self-sacrifice and love. Do this requires us again, as St. Paul says, to be watchful, to stand fast in the faith, to be brave, and to be strong, to not return evil for evil, to pray for our enemies, to do good to the poor and to become intercessors for the downtrodden. To keep our minds, hearts, and bodies faithful to God and faithful to our spouse, if we're married. Resisting and opposing any electronic or human temptation to infidelity or unchastity. We see before us today two ways. The way of self-love as the wicked vine dressers that seeks to control, to know better, to satisfy all of my fallen desires, that is, the way that seems to lead upward, but descends to the depths of hell. Or the way of light, the way of self-sacrificing and crucified love, of divine love, the way of purity, generosity, faithfulness, and humility, the way that seems painful at first, but is the only way that truly sets us free. And if we've drifted onto the wrong path, if we find that conviction in our hearts, don't worry, don't despair, it's for this very reason that our Lord ascended the cross, to offer us the way, the way forward. It wouldn't be foolish to keep going that same way, but what should we do? Repent and return to the Lord, to turn back, to confess, to reorient our life back to Him, that course correction. Let's center our life back on Him, on that way, that way of life, toward the only one who brings real joy, unending joy, quiet peace, liberation from the bonds of sin and death, and the abundant and eternal life with God in His heavenly kingdom. To Him be all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.